This week, we're gonna focus on social injustice. This has the potential to be an uncomfortable topic. So going into it, we wanna keep a few things in mind to set ourselves up best for success. First, this topic may be incredibly convicting. When we're convicted, we tend to respond in one of two ways. We may respond with a remorseful, repentant heart. On the other hand, we may respond with a defensive, hardened heart. Let's be aware of the temptation to victim blame. If we could convince ourselves that the victims of social injustice are the ones to blame, then we won't feel as pressured by God to do something about it. Also, let's be wary of the temptation to, to narrow the definition of social injustice to be so thin that we imply that it virtually does not exist. These reflex reactions may dull the call of God to stand up for the oppressed, but sometimes feeling the weight of responsibility may actually be what's necessary to obey Christ in this crucial area. Second, whatever we can do to avoid putting one another, other group members on the defensive while still showing God's expectation for our lives sets us up for success and life change. A good way to do this is by asking open-ended questions. Things like, what do you mean by that? Or what would this look like in your life? Be solution-oriented and work together to find out what standing up to social injustice can really look like in each of our lives. It's easy to think that in biblical times, people lived in biblical ways, but it turns out they were just people. People like you and me who followed God with passion, but who also neglected his word when it served their interests. In Nehemiah 4, we learned that the Sumerians, or, or Samaritans as Jews would call them, it's the same thing but intended to be derogatory. They were doing everything they could to make life as hard as possible for the people in Jerusalem. In chapter five though, we get some sad news. Not only were the pagans oppressing the Jews, the rich Jews were oppressing the poor ones. And in many ways, the rich Jews were treating the poor even worse than the Samaritans were. Let's take a look. Nehemiah 5, verse 4, it says, And others said, We have had to borrow money on our fields and vineyards to pay our taxes. So the people, they've begun to starve. And in order to make ends meet and still pay their taxes, poor Jews began borrowing money from wealthy Jews. Now, instead of helping them, though, the rich Jews only charged interest. And it didn't matter that doing so only made the problem worse. The poor weren't like them. Their poverty wasn't their fault, it was their own problem. Who cares if the poor become poorer, as long as the rich could just become richer? So the poor Jews said, verse five, we belong to the same family as those who are wealthy, and our children are just like theirs. Yet we must sell our children into slavery just to get enough money to live. So no, wait a minute. They sold their children into slavery? How could they do that? They must be so selfish. They probably deserved to have their kids taken away because why didn't they just get a better job or work harder? You see, that's unfortunately the attitude a lot of us have to victims of social injustice. Maybe not when we read this passage in the Bible because, you know, hey, it's the Bible. We're spiritual when we're reading God's word. However, we can quickly blame the victims when we hear similar stories if those families don't look like us, if they don't speak our language or dress like us or come from the same place we do. See, reading motives and poor choices into someone's life circumstances takes so much responsibility off our shoulders. What happens though when we see circumstances pressing in on people beyond their control? What happens when we start seeing the poor as people who've been taken advantage of? What happens when we start caring more about what's happening to them now instead of being so focused on what they may have done to get themselves in the situation in the first place? Well, I'll tell you, we start seeing people doing whatever they can, making whatever desperate choices they have to just to get enough money to live. We've already sold some of our daughters, the passage continues to say, and we are helpless to do anything about it for our fields and vineyards are already mortgaged to others. See, this sentence contains three words that sum up the crushing weight social injustice lays on the shoulders of its victims. We are helpless. So how do we respond to that? Do we say, 
be a self-made man or woman, do we say, pull yourself up by your bootstraps? Many will take a posture towards the victims of social injustice that says it's their responsibility to get themselves where we, in a place of stability, are today. The Christ follower, however, is given different instructions. Proverbs 31 verses eight to nine says, speak up for those who cannot speak for themselves. Ensure justice for those being crushed. Yes, speak up for the poor and the helpless and see that they get justice. Hoping they can get to where we are is not enough. The Christ follower is called to go to them and bring them where we are. It's not enough to not be unjust. Ensuring justice means being anti-injustice. That means it's not enough to simply not take advantage of others. The Christ follower needs to be anti-oppression. We need to be anti-misogynistic, anti-xenophobic, anti-racist. God calls us to be more than passive, more than just not guilty. He calls us to speak up and ensure justice. Champions of justice speak up when they have nothing to gain. They do so because it's not about them. It's about God's command that his followers stand in the gap. That takes moral courage. If we fail to use our voice, we will lose our voice. Our silence is noticed by those who need us to speak up. It's noticed by those who do harm and they take it as a free pass to harm more. Our silence is noticed by God. So what can you do? What can you do to ensure justice, to speak up for the poor and the helpless? It can feel overwhelming. The good news is it doesn't have to. Change takes place one step at a time. So what's your next step? Well, as we dive into Nehemiah chapter five, together, let's find out what that next step looks like for you. We're Ross and Debbie Meyer. We have been going to CCV now for about 10 years. And I think we fell in love, well, I did. I, I fell in love with CCV when um, we started doing the Christmas store. Um, That's one of our favorite. Being able to serve the kids um, at Christmas is a real true blessing. I am the, uh, everything has to be in a line, everything has to make sense. And Deb is more, she does it by faith. Even before we went to CCV, we were starting our own company. So money was, there was not a lot of money to be spread around. So our giving in, in, in the very early stages of our marriage was very much, well, we have this much left over, so we'll give that. But then as we um, started to grow as a couple, started to grow in our relationship with the Lord, um, our giving came out of more of a challenge. We have owned our own company. I've owned the company now for 30 plus years. And about two years ago, God began to work in my heart. He was asking me a very simple question. Ross, do you trust me? And I would say, well, sure I do, Lord. I trust you with my life. I gave you my life and you're my savior. And the Lord would say to me, Ross, do you trust me? And I said, Lord, of course I do. He says, that, Ross, that's not what I'm asking you. He's saying, do you trust me? And my answer was always yes. And then one day it came very clearly. And he says, if you trust me, then give me your company. And that was a very hard decision because I'd built that company. And the Lord reminded me that it wasn't me who built the company, it was him who built the company. The money that I received through the company was not my money, it was his money. And my heart began to change. As my heart began to change, I all of a sudden realized that giving is easy because it's not mine. And I'm giving it because I'm giving it out of love, um, not out of obligation, not out of a 10% or a whatever number would be, but I'm giving back because of what He has given me. I have fallen in love with Christ like no other. He's become my father. His daddy. My dad. <laughs> and I am His beloved son. So for me, it's been the ability to say yes and to trust knowing that whatever Christ has asked me to do, it can happen because 
He's my dad, he's asked me to do it. And we can never outgive God. No. When you see a little kid who has had nothing go through the Christmas store, you know what it's all about. You want to give 10 times more than you gave. When you walk into a family's home that has nothing, and all you're doing is bringing them a turkey or whatever it might have been, you realize that the little bit you gave, you would have given 20 times more to see that blessing over and over again. Saying yes to God says no to myself. When I look at what we are doing with the company, in the world's eyes, it does not make sense to do what we are doing. Um, but in God's eyes, it makes perfectly good sense. And all of a sudden I realize when I look at the future and become scared, my eyes are on me. And when I look at the future and I look at it with God's eyes, I am totally excited. So what God has done in our lives is that one, we are closer now together as a couple than we have ever been in 36 years of marriage. We are on our knees almost daily together, praying together, looking to the future, asking Christ, where are you taking us? What are you doing? What do you want to do? Not just asking for specific things, but being open to where, where you want to take us, what do you want to do? I've studied the life of Job. One of the things that amazed me is when Job loses everything, and at the end of the book of Job, Job is talking to God, and he says to God, he says, I had heard about you with my ears, but now I have seen you with my eyes. We have seen Christ in another way, and I have seen him with my heart. He has changed my heart. Someone asked me years ago who I was, and my answer would have been, I am a landscape contractor. Now, I answer, I am the Son of God, and He loves me so much.